<clears throat> Shalom everyone, grace and peace be unto you. Welcome back to my channel. I'm Apostle Claudia Morgan Sr. And as always, I do look forward to this time of coming into this place, this space to share the word of the Lord. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. And uh, I want to ask you that if you are being blessed by the content, if you are being blessed by the teaching, that you would um, kindly subscribe to this channel and uh, share with your contacts because the point of um, this channel, the, the, the intent, the motive is that we spread the word of truth as we teach the word of truth in its context so the body of Messiah can be extended here on earth so more and more people will learn and come to the knowledge of the truth so please help me to do that let us do it right um let us do it together so this week we are starting in the book of leviticus right and the reading for this portion the store portion is from leviticus chapter 1 up to chapter 5 down to 26. no I don't have the time to read it um, in this space because I am trying to keep these videos not more than 35 minutes really so I would encourage you to do your own reading but when I read what I would normally do is to highlight particular particular areas that the Spirit of the Lord would have been impressed significantly on my heart and I would come out to share with you so that is what I will be doing today all right um, <clears throat> a, a general overview on the book of Leviticus is that it details the um, the five types of offering that were required in worshiping God in the tabernacle and by extension the temple um, we are coming out of the book of Exodus where we now see the construction and the erection of the temple. Um, in our last session, we learned that Moses was not able to enter because of the presence of the Shekinah glory. But God would not have them um, constructed and instructed the tabernacle and at the same time not allowing them to enter in, right? So now we're going to get into the book of Leviticus to understand how people enter into that holy place, right? So it talks about the kinds of offerings. So there were elevation offerings, there were meal offering, there were peace offering, there were sin offering, and there were different types of variable offerings, right? It also covers the consecration of the priesthood. It talks about ceremonial purity laws and standard of living for God's holy people. And what we will learn, the sum total of this, is that sacrifices are offerings which allow human to come near to God. It is always God's desire that we be drawn close to him. And so before I actually get into the meat of the matter, I want to commit this word to the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege you give us, Lord. You allow us to enter into your most holy place. We thank you that we come not in our own merits, but we come on the merit of Yeshua, the Messiah, the righteous one, the holy one. As we come to you today, Lord, to learn of you, as we come, we sit at the table waiting on you to feed us by means of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will break down your word and you will help us to receive. I pray that you will give us an appetite and a great desire of your word. I pray that we shall be filled or to capacity, as Yeshua said, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so, Father, I pray your holy anointing over this session. I pray that I shall decrease and that you shall be, and you shall increase. I pray, Hashem, that your name will be glorified through the earth by all your people. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So, um, we, at this, um, in, this in, in our teachings, we teach. Um, 
from the foundation of scripture. Just this week, I got a call from a sister of mine who watched one of the videos and she said, it sounds very Jewish by nature. And I said, yes, because the Bible, the word of God is a Jewish book. It was written to a Jewish people. We serve a Jewish Messiah and we anticipate the return of a Jewish Messiah. So naturally, you're going to hear the Jewishness of the word coming from this space that we teach from. And I pray that you will be blessed by that. So we will also learn some Hebrew words as we go along, right? So the Hebrew name of this book, Leviticus, is Vaikra. And it comes from the first few words of the book in Leviticus. And I let me just read, because I want to read just verse 1 to 3. It says, He called to Moses, and Hashem spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, say to them, When a man among you bring an offering, and I would want you to highlight that in your Bible. When a man among you bring an offering to Hashem from animals, from the cattle, or from the flock, you shall bring your offering, right? If one's offering is an elevation offering from the cattle, he shall offer as an unblemished male. And as we continue the reading, which I would encourage you to do, it details the specification of the types and the kinds of offerings that would come as, as we present before the Lord. So it says, and he called. That's where the name of the name Vaikra comes from. God called to Moses, right? And every time God calls, it is for elevation. God is holy. And each time he calls us, he wants us to come higher. So this, as we read, is about the third time that we are seeing that God called to Moses. He called to Moses from the midst of the burning bush. He called to Moses at, from the midst of the cloud at Mount Sinai. And here again in Leviticus chapter 1, God called to Moses and speak to him from the tent of meeting. Today, as we speak, God is still calling. He is, call, he is still calling to his people through Yeshua, the Messiah. Yeshua came into this world. He dwelt among us. And his desire is that we be drawn closer to him, that we come to live. He came to live within us. He made that great deposit of the Holy Spirit within us. And the purpose of that is that we are constantly drawn to him in righteousness and in holiness. So in our last session, I made the point that Studying the book of Leviticus is going to give us a better understanding of the sacrificial system. It gives greater appreciation of the life of Yeshua the Messiah and, it, <clears throat> and God's plan of redemption as is revealed in the scripture. God's intent is, is to restore mankind to relationship with him and that it has been like that since the fall in the Garden of Eden. The book of Leviticus um, is not read by many people, right? As a matter of fact, not just the book of Leviticus, the, the whole Old, um, Old Testament scripture, what is called the Old Testament scripture, is not read by many people. But the book of Leviticus is key and it is central in helping us to understand what holiness is because the book of Leviticus speaks specifically to holiness. Nowadays, I did, I, I did say this last week when we met, it seems holiness is no longer central to the believer's walk. We don't hear much teaching on holiness anymore. But <clears throat> God is strict, always strict about holiness, right? And as we read through scripture, we see at different points how he deals with people as it relates to holiness. When he gives instructions, we are called to obey, right? It is always God's principle to divide, to elect and separate. Always his principle. He makes distinction and he set boundaries. He draw the line, right? He is holy. <clears throat> and the measuring stick applies to every one of us. God is holy. 
in Leviticus chapter 19 to we read um, you shall be holy <coughs> for I am holy God is holy his holiness remains forever and evermore right he's not gonna water down his standard to come to our level I, I feel that many still believe that that can happen now we need to ascend we need to elevate our walk and what the book of leviticus is teaching is how do we elevate our walk with god so the sacrificial system um prescribed was there to maintain relationship with god and it was there to repair or to bring restoration where there was brokenness as a result of sin right the system was set up on up on um so the, the 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 sinner could benefit from the system and it was about obedience and reconciliation with god's system of justice so that we could have relationship restored with him god put something in place so man could be restored right so the levitical um, sacrificial system that God gave to Israel um, it did not have remedy for all sins committed not all sins but what we're going to learn is that there were sins that were um, actually forgiven during um, the system that time of the system right not every sin could be atoned for not every sin could be covered by animal sacrifice and we learn a lot from that from the Apostle Paul's writing so offering could not atone for sins that were committed intentionally, right? Um, so naturally there were um, intentional sins and there were unintentional sins. We needed a greater system in place, right? That would penetrate the heart of men. And that is why Yeshua's sacrifice is referred to as the superior sacrifice because his atonement penetrates the heart his atonement his atonement um dig deep into our spirit his atonement penetrate the darkness of our heart and cause the light of his glory to supernaturally illuminate in us it is really a miracle as to how that happened right um the the the, the Levitical sacrificial system, um, like I said, it could not atone for all sins. We needed a greater, a superior sacrifice. And Yeshua did that, right? And we're going to hear a lot more on that as we go through this study. So here we are, and we are learning about the different types of sin, intentional and intentional. And uh, it is now in chapter four that we also learn about sin offering. And what we're, what we're going to see is that um, there were other offerings that were made daily in the temple that did not have anything basically to do with sin. Um, when we talk about sin offering, we're going to connect. We're going to go down into Hebrews chapter eight. And I'm, I want to encourage you to read that um, book. That chapter Hebrews chapter 8 the Apostle Paul teaches on the great high priest the great high priest who satisfies the need of all people Yeshua's superiority to that of the Levitical priesthood and um, it teaches us about the Messiah who is our great high priest the one who can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities the one who now sits on the right hand of his father right the one who come who came and he gave his life and he is now sitting on the right hand of his father making intercession for us and we await his second return the one who serves in the holy place the true tent of meeting the the apostle paul says he's the one who the the, the, the true tent of meeting that is erected not by human hands but by god himself what are we learning here? We are learning that when we study the book of Leviticus, we understand the fulfilled role of Yeshua, our Messiah. 
So back in Exodus, God gives Moses the definition for sin, right? Which is contained in the law. And he explained the consequences for sinning by breaking any of the ordinances of the law code. But by giving, um, by the giving of the law, the Lord also set out the moral choices for Israel. He set out moral choices for all humanity, moral choices that determines if people will decide to obey or to disobey. We have free will. God has given to every man free will, right? So now in Leviticus, God is giving to Moses the flip side of what happened in the book of Exodus. He is providing no atonement when someone sins and break law code. God is a God of mercy and grace, right? Mercy and grace goes hand in hand. And there was never a time in scripture when God speaks judgment without mercy. And, and these are foundational pillars, right? Embedded in scripture from the beginning. Mercy and grace, justice, mercy, and grace goes hand in hand. Matter of fact, when God revealed his name to Moses, right? His name represents his attributes of mercy. And it, this is what is used now in connection to offerings. When we come to offer our prayers to God, when we come to lift up our prayers to him, we are seeking him, the one who is merciful. He is the one who allows us access into his throne room of grace and mercy, right? So he is always merciful. And so the name of God revealed different character, his different characters. The name Elohim represents his attributes of judgment because he is also the God of judgment, right? So offerings are mean are means to draw us to God, the merciful one. What is that telling us? We should be anxious. We should be anxious to bring our gift to God. We should be anxious to bring us this um, sacrifice to him. We should be anxious to do that. He is basically waiting to hear from us, right? So Leviticus chapter 3, 1, um, 1 to 3, those verses that I read, the word um, sacrifice or offerings, um, the Hebrew word is carbonate. And it, it is usually translated sacrifice or offerings as we read in our, in our Bible. And both of these terms suggest a loss of something or giving up of something. Every time we bring a sacrifice to God, we are giving up something every time we bring a, 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 an offering to God we are releasing from us and we are giving to him that which he is worthy of so when we bring um, our offering to God something must give every time we give an offering or a sacrifice something would give in second Samuel chapter 24 we read about King David and I would also encourage you to read this um, chapter. King David sent out his men to number, numera, um, number the people of Israel. And it was forbidden from the time of Moses because God gave Moses instructions as to how the people of Israel should be counted. They should not be counted numerically. One, two, three, four, five. No. God, God gave to Moses how it was to be done. And in this chapter, we are reading that um, King David did the opposite. And he realized that what he did was wrong. Right. As a result, a plague broke out on the people. The people had to suffer for the consequence of the king's error. King David realized what he did was wrong, but guess what? He took responsibility. So David, the Lord gave David three options. I want you to read them. 
and David um, accepted and David get to the point where he needed to offer to the Lord. He, need, he needed to build an altar to offer sacrifice to the Lord. And in, in doing so, the people would be released from the plague, right? So King David had the opportunity to get the property free, which is called the threshing floor. But David said, no, I don't want it free. No, I want to pay for it because I will not sacrifice to the Lord. I will not offer to the Lord, my God, burnt offering that cost me nothing right? A burnt offering was one that was totally burnt up. Nothing was left for the priest or for anyone to partake of. So King David learned this principle from the Torah. That's where he learned it from. You have to give totally. I will not offer to the Lord burnt offering sacrifices that cost me nothing. Remember I said earlier, something must give. And what is going to give is our disobedience, our self-centeredness, our pride, our arrogancy, our ignorance. These are some of the things that we are now going to have to learn to put on the altar to become that whole burnt offering to God. So as we come to faith um, in our walk with, with Yeshua the Messiah, we are to become that sacrifice that is totally burnt up, all for his glory and nothing for self. In Romans chapter 12, the apostle Paul talks about that sacrifice. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice. Right? In the time of temple worship, it was physically burning of the animal. In our time, we have now become the temple of the living God. The Spirit of God indwells us. We have to become that altar. So what kind of sacrifices are we placing before our God? From the reading, I want to focus specifically on the, um, the first offering mentioned in the text. Right? If one's offering is an elevation offering, that, that was the first offering. Elevation offering or a burnt offering, um, or also called an Ola offering. It was a voluntary offering. And the purpose of the offering is that the, 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 um, um, it was to allow the people to draw near to God. It was to allow the people to come close to God where their walk would have been elevated. It is to bring one closer to God and to elevate oneself. That's the purpose of the offering. So when the people present this offering to God, they were basically asking God to accept them, the worshiper, who brought the sacrifice to come near and to experience his peace, to experience peace with God, right? That's what they were basically doing. So sometimes we think of the temple and we tend to feel that the only thing that happened in the temple was um, making sacrifice for sin and all that. No, persons wanted to be drawn closer to God so daily they would go to that place with their with, with their voluntary offering to lift this offering to God because their desire is that they be drawn closer to him. So the, the offering was seen as a gift from the worshiper to God. And it means more than watching the smoke going up, right? It means more than um, that the smoke was emitted from the, from the burning of the animal's flesh as, that, as it ascended up into the heaven. When God smelled the smoke, it was like a pleasing aroma to him. It, give, it gives him pleasure. It became a sweet aroma, right? But there is more to it than that because the act indicated two things that we're going to look at. It indicated that the individual was being obedient to his command. Obedience, as we say over and over again, is central to the word of God. Obedience is key to the Christian life. Obedience is what God's, God requires. 
He's pleased to see the smoke going up. But greater than that, he looked at the worshiper to say, this person is walking in obedience to my instruction. And that is what he desires. And secondly, the, the, the offering the offering allows the person to be filled with peace, to be filled with shalom, right? When we are in right standing with God, we experience peace. Shalom is taking place. And shalom is, is not, not just the absence of war, but from a Hebrew context, it speaks to wholeness, it speaks to completeness, it speaks to fullness. It is saying that the fullness of the Lord is in my life. The Apostle Paul teaches, for we are to God the pleasing aroma of Yeshua among those who are being saved, right? We are pleasing aroma. We, it is saying that we, this sacrifice smells good. The fragrance from us should be, um, should affect the lives of so many other people. The, the aroma that we give off, people from a distance should be able to catch it. It's like saying catch the fire, right? So God desperately wants to be at peace with his people. It is always God's plan. Man wants to be at peace with God. And so when Yeshua died, we are told that it pleased God. Amen. That sacrifice pleased God for his own son to be sacrificed because he brought man that is what his death does. He brought man closer to God and to eternal peace. We are drawn closer to him. And so throughout scripture, we see sacrifices being offered at different points in times. And we could well consider the sacrifice that um, was offered. We could well consider when Abraham tried to offer his only son, Isaac, as a sacrifice, as he was instructed by God. So Isaac was basically to be killed and burned up on that altar. And, and from this, we see that um, it was, yes, it was in God's plan, but it was about, it was, it, he was to become a burnt offering. It was about total surrender and obedience to God on the part of the worshiper, Abraham, right? And, and from this, it also demonstrate the, it also demonstrate the principle of substitution, where Isaac was replaced by the ram in the ticket. And we tend to preach a lot using that situation as, as God providing in time in the need of his people but there are there there are more spiritual principles coming from that text that we can also look at right so the the ram came the horn was caught into the bush into the ticket right and uh, so the the sacrificial um system as it were that example was also a foreshadowing it was a type it was a type Isaac was to be the price paid voluntarily in order that mankind could be at peace with God. It was a true reflection of the Levitical sacrificial system. And we see Yeshua the Messiah, <clears throat> though Isaac, though Abraham, um, it, it, it did not end in death, physical death, but spiritually, um, we see God manifesting himself, right? And we see Yeshua, the Messiah, who would become the sacrificial lamb. And God saw Abraham's obedience. <clears throat> God, the father, looked at Abraham's role. God, the father, looked and took Abraham's role, right? And Yeshua took Isaac's place. That is a perfect example of 
of, of what the sacrificial system is like, right? God took Abraham's place and Yeshua took Isaac, took Isaac's place and we have the complete sacrifice. So as we close, from the first offering, we are learning the importance of obedience. For us to be drawn near to God, we must understand the importance of obedience. We are quite familiar with a quote <coughs> um, that says obedience is better than sacrifice. And we use it all the time. It's well known. And... Uh, it tells the story of King Saul, right? How Samuel the prophet um, had to, uh, he had to, um, he had to, the Lord sent him to speak to King Saul. The Lord sent him with a word to King Saul because King Saul continues to disobey God's commandments, right? So King Saul was the first king of Israel and uh, he was known for his victorious battles against the enemies of Israel, particularly the Amalekites. The Amalekites were dangerous people. We, we read about the Amalekites when the people of Israel were coming out of Egypt and out of nowhere for no reason whatsoever. Amalek came upon Israel and they attack Israel. The word of God says they attack Israel from the back end. They attack Israel, the people who were the elderly, the children, the lame, they were tired and, and, and they were just a weak, weak set of people. They had no idea of warfare. They weren't prepared for war. They weren't at the place. And Amalek out of nowhere attack Israel and uh, God was not pleased, right? And so at some point later, God, but, but, the, but the Lord did say to me, remember Amalek, because he at some point was going to deal with Amalek for what he did. God commanded Saul to totally destroy the Amalekites, right? And Saul, and the people, they speared King um, Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen, the fatted calves and the lambs and all that was good. And they would not utterly destroy it. So it means that they destroyed some, but they did not destroy some. And what we are seeing is partial obedience is still disobedience when you don't go all the way it is still considered disobedience right so when samuel confronted saul on his disobedience saul now shift the blame to the people he said he allowed the saving um he allowed the saving the good things in order to sacrifice them to God as an offering. He allowed them so he could sacrifice them to God as an offering. And right at this point, we are faced with the question, what are you holding back with the intent of being a sacrifice? What do you have in reservation? What is it that is not fully laid on the altar of sacrifice? And what is it that you have in your position that is defiling your walk with God? What is it you are giving to God as partial sacrifice? We can learn a lesson here. Because of disobedience, God rejected King Saul as king of Israel. People of God, the word of God is from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Right? We saw where Saul disobeyed by, by saving the king um, Agag. And then later we are going to learn in the book of Esther 
that the spirit of Amalek is always alive. The spirit of Amalek is always coming at people to destroy you. And that was what happened even in the book of Esther, which we will be, um, well, at some point, I guess we can share on that as we, as we come to learn of the Feast of Purim and we can teach so people understand the fullness of the word of God. So the point is, God's intent is that we are drawn to him and it is out of obedience. Today, people of God from the Torah, we learn that God is asking for our all, nothing less. And if we are giving ourselves as that sacrifice, it is all or none at all, right? All or none at all. Partial obedience is what is called disobedience, right? So for us to enter into that holy place, we are learning obedience. We are learning that we are giving of ourselves to God so we can receive his peace and his fullness in our lives. Thank you for listening. I pray you're blessed. Please join us next week as we continue this study. Be good and have a very productive week ahead of you. Thank you.